Hello and welcome to the Upon Further Review podcast brought to you by Field Street Baptist Church. On this podcast, your host Cody Kitchen sits across the table from Dr. John Hall as he reviews his Sunday sermon from the week before. Good afternoon, our podcast listeners. It is Wednesday, if you did not know, we're recording this a day late, but we are nonetheless recording Upon Further Review. As always, I'm your host, Cody Kitchen, and joined with me is the one, the only, Dr. John Hall. Good afternoon, everyone. Always got to put you up. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, before we get started, as always, we need to do a shout out to our faithful listener, Tanner Tilton. Yes, Tanner Tilton, who's currently at home taking care of his dad. Yes. Yeah, Tom's recovering from a procedure. and um, he has his pal at his side, and That's Tanner's right. a good son. Way to go, Tanner. Yep. Well, we are talking about the sermon from this Sunday, which was titled, A King Who Gave It All Away. One verse. Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Yes. And what a powerful one verse it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you prepared this sermon, what are some things that came to mind? Oh, the number of people that would freak out <laughs> because it was just one verse. <laughs> I really did have that on my mind. I savored it. Yes. It's such a great verse, but I know there's people want, wanting us, you know, move along. So don't miss this Sunday where, you know, basically plow up a whole chapter. Yeah. Yep. So well, that was what was on my mind. Plus, it is a fantastic verse, and the gospel is right in that one verse. Who is Jesus? What did he do? What was the result? Yeah. It's, it's such a well-crafted verse. So I thought, man, this is a feast, even though it's one verse. And I know people are going to look at it and go, how can you build a sermon for 25 minutes on one verse? Yeah. That's it's, what, all, it's all there. That's what I was just about to say is uh, the most, most of the common people <laughs> don't understand that one verse, how, man, that's not easy to do. But no. with this, with this uh, verse, you did a great job of it. Well, thank you. It God. practically preaches itself. You just right. kind of have to get out of the way of the verse because the verse, once you see it, and my job is to help bring light to it and, and help people see the verse kind of under a microscope, then you see the beauty of it. And it really, it was a feast, man. It was steak, potatoes, cheddar biscuits, ice cold sweet tea. Yeah. That's what preaching is. Yeah. Getting out of the way. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Let the text do its thing. Well, as you've already said, you had three ideas in which you brought forward, and, uh, man, they were great ideas. First, who is Jesus that we see in verse 9? Yeah. <laughs> and then your second idea, the second question is, what did Jesus do that we also see in verse 9? Correct. And then your third idea or third question was, what was the result that we see in verse 9. Exactly. So, uh, this one verse, like you've already said, was really rich, and it brought a lot forward to us. And uh, you, talk, you talked about, um, starting with who is Jesus, about the example of who Jesus was, the model that he is, and that every believer knows the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you brought the point that if you are a believer, if you are a true believer of Christ, and you know the grace in which you have received, that this unmerited favor that you described. You also talked about how Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Master, and you even talked about, and I love that you brought this up, is that you have to love Jesus more than you even love your family, um, which makes you think twice. Mm-hmm. And not about loving Jesus, but just how much do you truly do love Jesus? Because I love my family a whole lot. Absolutely. And so right. it was a good example to, to see that. How much do you truly love Jesus? And that you talked about how Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Christ, and you gave us um, examples of who Jesus was and what we see through through Scripture. Uh, if you did not watch the sermon, stop it now. Go watch it because it's really good. Um, but, but you talk about, well, who is our Savior? And you talk about He is the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question is, why is it important to see Jesus as Lord and not just our Savior? Great question. And my answer preliminarily would be because that's how he is presented in scripture and that's just one example in second corinthians 8 is it verse 9 yes that's a joke second corinthians 8 9 paul presents christ as 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as I stated in the sermon, you can't take Jesus only as Savior and not have him as Lord. In fact, when we baptize a new believer in our church, one of the things, one of the statements or questions I pose to a baptismal candidate is, do you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? So I think it's paramount importance that we acknowledge that Jesus is both Savior and Lord. He's not just Savior now and then later on, I'll receive him as Lord when I'm ready to live the, the obedient life. No, you take him as Savior and Lord simultaneously, and you get yourself off the throne, and Christ takes up residence on the throne and center of your heart and life. So I think we, we think of Jesus as Savior and Lord because that is exactly how he is presented in Scripture. You're to go, you know, go and sin no more. So what that's saying is that you receive Christ as Savior by repentance and faith, and then you strive with God's grace to live the obedient life, a life of yielding to the lordship of Jesus Christ, where he's the boss, he's the master, he reigns and rules over your life. You don't get him any other way. You can't say, well, I want Jesus as my Savior because I don't want to go to hell. But I want to live kind of how I'm living now. (laughs) There's no presentation of that in Scripture. There's always a radical change. There's always a radical difference, a breaking free, a breaking of ways with the old life, the old man. And that is called lordship. So it's vital because the Scripture presents Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's good. It makes me think of the verse talk, calling Jesus the lion and the lamb. That, you know, in that same, it's the same exact concept, but that a lot of people, it's easy for people to see Jesus as the lamb, but sometimes it's hard for them to see Jesus as the lion. Mm. And I think it's that same thing is it we have to have Jesus both as, see him both as he is the lion and he is the lamb. He's the one whom saved us, whom is our Savior, but he's also our Lord, mm. the one who is the rightful judge who sits upon the throne. Mm. And uh, because of our, I think, our finite human minds, we, of course, would like to see Jesus just as Savior, mm. just as uh, the Lamb. But the reality is, is he's both, and there's a reason why he's both, and we need both. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting concept for sure. Yeah. Um, and be reminded. It's so good to be reminded that both are so important for well, us. And to be frank, the church is full of people who have Jesus as their Savior, but lordship is a whole other matter. Yep. I mean, look at the empty pews we have, not just in our church, but in churches all across this country. That's exactly right. If Jesus was really Lord of people's lives, of his people's lives, our churches would be full and overflowing. You're absolutely right. So don't tell me Jesus is Lord of your life. You don't even come to church. Yep. Give me a break. Amen. <laughs> I mean, that's just bonkers. Yeah, that needs to be like that we, stupid segment. That isn't, isn't need to be that <laughs> stupid segment. So that needs to be like our our uh, highlight uh, voice right there. Just yeah. you don't go to church. <laughs> come on. You're right. It's like uh, Steve Camp had a song that, that I used to listen to when I was a college student, and it was, don't tell them Jesus loves them until you're ready to love them too. Mm. His songs were always hard-hitting for me. You know, like, really, ouch. Um, do I really want to listen to that again? Because it's so, so much truth in it. It's very confrontational kind of truth. So when we make a statement like, you know, if Jesus is really Lord of your life, then it's going to bear forth in the way you live your life, yeah. your values, your priorities, your commitments, the choices you make, and how you steward the Lord's day. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I just went to meddling. That's all right. Probably a few people just clicked this on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, your second idea was, what did Jesus do? And we 
And you talked about in the verse, um, since it's just one verse, I'm going to read it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And you talked about the phrase that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. And you talked about, which is true, that what a stunning statement that this is. And uh, you quoted Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. And how we see that the Paul and a lot of the New Testament writers are setting the preexistence of Christ with this declaration, though he was rich, uh, that he had this pre, but rather of his preexistent state, um, Christ is rich as God is rich. I loved how you set the stage up to explain wh- who Christ was from the beginning that he is rich, and with God he was rich, but he came to this world that he laid aside, as you said, quote, the Lord Jesus laid aside the independent exercise of all of his divine prerogatives, left his glory in place with God, took on human form, and died on a cross like a common criminal, that he became poor. So what makes the reality of Jesus becoming poor on our behalf so rich? It's... I don't know if I can even really do justice to that question because I'm not sure I fully can comprehend it. It doesn't lessen my appreciation for it, but I just cannot really wrap my head around what Jesus did. And to learn from the Scripture that he did it willingly, obediently, and voluntarily took the form of man God became man, came to this earth, emptied himself, became a servant, died a common criminal's death, left left the glory and the riches of heaven. And when we talk about Jesus being a king, we are quick to say, you know, he's the king of kings. I don't know that we fully get that. He isn't just a king, but he's the king of kings, and he's a king of a kingdom that's incomprehensible. It cannot be measured. It's vast. You know, I mean, whatever superlatives you want to attach to it. So in an effort to explain, you know, why is that so incredible? And he entered into the poverty and profanity of this world and died a criminal's death. And the Father raised him back to life. It's incredible what Jesus did. And why anyone would say no to him is beyond comprehension. When you see what he did and what he gave up, at least temporarily, you know, set aside a lot of things to come to be our Savior. And so I think the reality of that is just, it's overwhelming. The magnitude of his love, his obedience to the Father, his willingness to have the Father's wrath poured out on him because of our sin. The fact that he came and offered himself as the mediator between us and God to bring the two parties together so that we could be reconciled to the Father. It's so rich. It has so many tentacles to it. It's such a picture of the gospel. I don't know if I'm answering the question in the direction you're kind of asking it, but, man, that's, that is an amazing concept to consider that Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God, a position of, of royalty and authority and reign and rule, laid that down and came here mm. and walked among people like us yeah. and died for us. He didn't die for his sin. He died for ours and took my place and yours, became our substitute. It's an incredible demonstration of the Father's love and Jesus' commitment to the Father's plan, yeah. which I believe was planned from eternity past, that the Father, the Son, the Spirit put all this together to, to save God's people. It is incredible. And the key cog in all of that was Jesus leaving heaven, huh. Jesus leaving that rich environment. I, I, I just... It's, you know, it's amazing. I mean, I've made sacrifices for my kids. I'm sure you do for yours, but not like that. Yeah. That's, 
I can't, that cannot be measured. And we talked about the week before, you know, one will hardly die for a righteous man, but Christ died for us while we were still helpless and ungodly and unreconciled to God. Incredible. It is incredible. For sure. <laughs> so there's a stab at it. No, and it's you, kind of a great question for anyone listening. You know, well, how would you answer that? Yeah. Well, I I honestly think that you answered that the best that anyone can, <laughs> and and even in your sermon, you I mean, you hit it right on. I loved how you set up for us to see what the text was saying is that Christ was has always been with God, and you set that up perfectly of saying this is who Jesus is. And the word became, you use that in such a beautiful way to, to portray to us. He became, mm. meaning he chose to, to be what he was here on earth. Right. And so I, I think that is the answer, and you answered it as best as I think you could have, that we truly can't comprehend that. Because as other places in the Bible, who would we, I mean, think about us as humans, would we really do that? You know, we talked about, I can't remember, but we talked about, uh, how Paul talks about he would give up his salvation for the salvation of others, you know, and that's becoming something, you know, that it's that same concept mm-hmm. that would we really, do we fully comprehend and understand what that means? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't get that. I, when Paul says he'd give up his own salvation for the salvation of his countrymen in the book of Romans, that is such a startling, stunning statement. I don't know if I'm there. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, and I probably shouldn't admit that, but I think about what Paul said, and I've read enough of Paul now and have marinated my own mind in his writings enough to know, man, when he said that, I don't think that was just preacher talk. Yeah. I think that guy meant it. That's a rare dude right there. Yes, it is. Paul, if you get the opportunity in heaven to, you know, break bread with him, you should take it. Yes. Yeah. So I, I suppose in eternity, there'll be all kinds of time. <laughs> you know, it would be for I'd like sure. To, I'd like to visit with him. I got some questions for Paul. Yeah. Yeah. It truly is amazing, and mm-hmm. just something that we. I don't like. I was saying, just we can't comprehend it. I don't think, as you said. Not completely. Not completely right. It doesn't lessen, like I said earlier, it doesn't lessen my appreciation and my awe of it. I just can't fully wrap my head around it. Huh. But Yeah, so listeners, now we ask you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> what makes the reality of Jesus being poor on our behalf so rich? Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Think well, your, uh, th- the third and final question that you asked was, well, what was the result? And uh, we talked about how You said this, quote, it's too good not to just say it the way you said it. The Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, for our sakes, gave it all away, or at a very minimum, temporarily laid it all aside and became poor. And then you ask the question again, what was the result? What was this outcome? And then the verse, Paul's telling us that believers become spiritually rich through the sacrifice of Christ. Man, that's beautiful. That's the gospel presented. And so my question is, what does it mean to be an heir of the kingdom of God, as you talked about on Sunday? Oh, it's so amazing. When we are born again, we become heirs of God. And all that God has now belongs to us. And we are joint heirs with Jesus. He's our elder brother. That is remarkable. I, I shared kind of a bit of tongue-in-cheek in the sermon Sunday about my own birth father and uh, that by the time he passed from this earthly life, he, he and his third wife had amassed a pretty good, I, I don't want to say fortune, but they'd, a, they'd amassed a pretty sizable amount of wealth. And uh, I thought, maybe. I didn't need it, didn't really want it per se or expect it. That might be a better way to say it. But in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, Maybe, just maybe, I'll inherit something as an heir. I'm his only son. So, like I said in the sermon, I got a brown envelope in the mail, and inside that envelope was a picture, my school picture of me in the third grade. And that was my inheritance. (laughs) 
That's all I got. And the point I was making by sharing that illustration was not so with God. I have this incredible inheritance from God given to me by grace through faith in Jesus Christ because of who he is and what he did for me and on my behalf. And by virtue of that, I am an heir of God's kingdom. So no matter what my material situation here is here on earth, and I've kind of experienced a wide spectrum through my lifetime, I am rich eternally and spiritually because one, I've been born again by the Spirit, and nobody can take that away from me. So I'm secure. I'm saved and secure, sealed by God's Spirit. And nothing can ever separate me from the love of God. Everything else is kind of a bonus, I guess. So it's helpful to remember, you know, sometimes things get lean for all of us, especially right now, the way the economy is for so many people. Yes. Uh, we, it's good to remember, you know what? A day is coming when I leave all this earthly stuff behind. I can't take any of it with me, and I won't. But the riches that await me are, are so much better than silver and gold, and the moss can't eat it away, rust can't destroy it, and it can't be stolen. So there's just God's economy is so much better. Hmm. So I, I, to be an heir of God, it's everything means I've been born again. I've been adopted into his family. By the way, you, you don't enter into God's family any other way. You have to be adopted into it. There's only one begotten son, right. Jesus. The rest of us have been adopted into God's family, whereby we are called sons and daughters of God. It's incredible. And so incredible. I love the metaphor of adoption in the scriptures. I used to just roll right over it, you know, like, oh, there it is. Yeah, you know didn't really make me stop and like hit the brakes well obviously now those Im images and metaphors mean so much more to me than they ever used to sure obvious for three obvious reasons but uh, anyway i think that's that's what it means to be an heir to the kingdom of god to, to receive from god this incredible spiritual inheritance that was purchased for us by christ that's good well, now on to uh, asking you, what are some of your final words? Hey, don't miss Sunday, because Sunday's going to be the first domino that falls where Paul starts talking about money, stewardship. Da -da -da. Yeah, da -da -da. can't wait. Nothing gets people's attention like money. <laughs> As I often say, people are funny about money, <laughs> but it's all through the Bible, and man, it's crystal clear. Uh, the kind of Pauline principles for stewarding what God entrusts to us. So yeah. it's a must-hear message for myself and for others, all believers, because regardless of what God sees fit to give you, all of us have a responsibility to steward it well. So, Sweet. yeah, Sunday's going to be awesome. Yeah. I hope people will be here. If you weren't here this Sunday, you need to come. If you were here this last Sunday, you also need to come. Yeah, We need you here. We had a great day. It was awesome. Yeah. Make it same day Sunday 2.0. Yeah, every day. Yeah. I mean, why don't we even have to have an emphasis like that? But, yeah, Sunday was a, a wonderful day, and the Lord gave us a lot of visible things to rejoice in with baptisms, the Lord's Supper, new members. Man, it was it was a full meal deal. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, on to uh, our next segment, our That Stupid segment, where we tell you what's stupid. So, John, what's stupid today? Everything related to politics. Yeah. So stupid. Uh, but locally, so I became aware through social media that that there's road construction now being initiated in some of the key areas where moms and dads are trying to take their children <laughs> to our local schools. Yes. And the timing seems stupid to me. You think? I think. I, I agree. But it's like, you know, we had June and July to do some of this. <laughs> I'm sure there are valid reasons that we're unaware of, so I'm not, you know, you know, poking anybody in the eye here, but it seems to me June and July were pretty mild around here as June and July goes. Why not do it then when 
the streets aren't as heavily trafficked like they are this morning. I'm sure it was complete chaos around some of our schools. It's the yeah. first day, and they have all the staggered starts to kind of help relieve traffic flow patterns. And I don't know, just from an outsider's point of view who's not informed, it seems stupid. Stupid. Which it is stupid. And uh, you would think it would have been thought out a little more. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. It Maybe people said, you dumber. know, this is the best time to do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'll tell you another thing that's stupid. We got a lot of leaks in the streets yep. around Cleburne. And what, what I'm afraid is going to happen, a lot of these leaks are just going to leak for weeks on end. And, and I know because I run the streets of Cleburne most mornings, and I see these leaks, you know, like leaks bubbling up out of the street. And it doesn't get fixed for weeks. And I'm like, man, that's stupid. Yeah, but they charge us a heck of a lot for yeah. water. Yeah, water's not cheap. No. Especially when it's running down a gutter that ain't yours. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the hot streets, it evaporates quickly. It's yeah. like, man, that's a precious resource. I'm sure somebody will fix that eventually. Yeah. Well, that is stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, as always, we're so thankful that you uh, listen to us. And remember... Uh, to send this to someone who you think would benefit from it. We would uh, appreciate that and make sure that you subscribe uh, to whatever channel you listen to us to. So we're, we're grateful for that. As always, remember, make Christ known by what you say and how you live. Have a great week. Thank you all for listening. And be sure to subscribe to Upon Further Review so you never miss an episode. If you have any questions, please be sure to reach out to us at info at fieldstreet.com. Thanks for tuning in.